In this week's update, don't give up on the lithium story. A toxic mix of news and events puncture market sentiment. And there is danger, but also great opportunity. My name's Gary Davis. As always, this is General Advice Only. And please remember to like and subscribe to the video. Tough week for the markets globally. A poor finish in the US on Thursday and Friday. But look, it's not a disaster yet. Markets uh, have not fallen apart. There's certainly been a reaction, but I guess given the mix that you'll see in a minute, the markets are entitled to have some sort of reaction to that. So um, let's get into it with a market perspective. So the, there's just about everything negative you could throw at the market is happening at the moment. We've got certainly the possibility of a of a wider and very destructive Middle East war. Um, and markets hate uncertainty. And I don't know whether you observed over the decades that when there's uncertainty about a war, markets tend to go into decline. And almost as soon as the war commences, that's the bottom for the market because the uncertainty is removed. So we've got still a great deal of uncertainty about what's happening in the Middle East. But, um, you know, that doesn't mean that if a war breaks out that the the, uh, the market is suddenly going to fall over. It's quite possible that, that the opposite happens. The second piece of the puzzle was that U.S. retail sales came in much hotter than expected. The growth was expected to be 0.3%. It came in at 0.7%, and that caught the market off guard as well. And then uh, Jeremy Powell delivered a pretty hawkish speech, uh, which was bad news for both stocks and bonds. Um, so he wasn't pulling any punches either. And one comment he made could be quite telling, and that is that in his opinion, fiscal deficits are unsustainable. In other words, the government is spending too much money. And so we've got a situation where bond supply is up. So the government is trying to raise more money. So they're, they're trying to sell more bonds. But global demand for US bonds is down because of events of the last couple of years um, where the, you know, the US has taken um, sanction action and so there's less and less appetite for U.S. bonds. And also Jeremy Powell's making it pretty clear that they're not going to go and reinstitute quantitative easing where the Fed monetizes the bonds. So supply up, demand down, and that's not a good mix for, uh, for the bond market. And yields spiked to 5%, which was the highest level since 2007. So there's no question that there is some you know, pretty dramatic things happening, and the and the stock market is not divorced from the bond market. What stresses that build up in the, in the bond market will flow over into the stock market, and just the fact that yields are close to five percent is uh, is enough anyway, because there are many stocks whose valuation multiples are priced on um, a much lower uh, long term interest rate figure. But then the question, of course, always is, you know, that's the status quo where we sit at the moment, but how much of that is already priced in? You know, that, that's always the unknown. And I can tell you that certainly a good deal of it is already priced in because that's what markets are very good at doing. And as we'll see in a minute, the S&P has been declining now for, uh, for a couple of months. So I don't think there's any need for drastic action yet, except if you are heavy in speculative stocks. It's just, I mean, they've been getting hit pretty hard this year, but there could be considerably more pain coming for the more uh, risky, more speculative end of the market, uh, companies that have got a lot of debt on their balance sheet, that don't have pricing power, all those things. So there is significant potential downside for a significant part of the market. What that does to the index, I really have no idea and I don't really care too much because I don't own the index. I don't trade the index. My focus is on, um, is on quality stocks as I'll get to a little bit later. So that's where we sit in terms of um, the general market at the moment. Now, just looking at lithium, um, commodity prices of the finished lithium uh, chemicals and spodumene are down 60 to 70% in this calendar year, which I think everyone would know. Um, and so naturally stock prices have followed and human nature as it is, 
you almost certainly get an overshoot to the downside, but further than what stock prices should fall, because people just get really pessimistic and it fuels itself. It becomes a downward spiral that just has to play out until all the weak hands are out of the market. So that's what we're seeing in the lithium market at the moment. And ultimately you reach a situation of capitulation. That's you know, the final phase where the, the, all the people that have been hanging on, hanging on, finally give up, throw the towel in the middle, and there's a, there's a final um, few days or week or so of, of lower prices on, um, on rising volume that normally ends up in, in some sort of um, capitulation phase. So I sense that there is a huge contrarian opportunity building here, but it's not yet. And it may not happen for um, for some period of time. So, just be aware that that this situation is building. It's a it's going to be a great long term opportunity, but the the when and at what level is an unknown. So you just want to keep that one on the sideboard. You really got to wait for the market to show the way in this this particular case. But I suspect, looking at the long term dynamics around lithium that this is going to be a, uh, a wonderful opportunity when it arrives. Turning to the American market, the S&P ended up falling 2.4% uh, across the week. The NASDAQ was down around 3.2%. Uh, and look, it's not the only thing, but, but Powell's comments really focused the market's attention on, on where things sit. Um, it's possible the market is still sort of processing the implications of some of these comments, but essentially he said that what is required is a likely lower economic growth and, and monetary policy is not yet too tight. So that's pretty telling. You know, that's saying that we've really got to slow down economic growth. And if we have to, we're going to take policy, monetary policy even tighter. Now, the market is currently pricing in that interest rates are done. So that's not good news for the market if the intention of the Fed is to, um, is to raise rates further. But equally, Powell did say that there could, be a, there could be a lag. There is usually a lag. And so we're going to give the interest rates that have occurred time to see what impact that has. So that's where we sit with respect to... Um, uh, to the Fed and their policy. Now, earnings season is underway in the States and um, there's, a, there's a bit of everything. Um, Tesla was down 9%, but Netflix was up 16%. So markets are still prepared to either punish or reward, um, quite emphatically, uh, stocks that deviate away from expectations. So you know it's not a disaster when, um, when a stock like Netflix comes out with um, you know, with a good report, but the price is up 16%. Um, if, you know, if the market was really, really concerned, you wouldn't see that sort of level of, of positive reaction. The US dollar um, dipped a little bit to, uh, to 106.16, but the yield um, traded to 2007 levels at, uh, at around 5%, and I think is about 4.9 to finish the week. Uh, the VIX also spiked a bit, but again, it's not drastic. It's not up in the 30s, uh, 21.7. And the 10-year, two-year spread continues to compress. We're now down. We were up at negative 1% um, earlier in the year. We're now down, getting close to, uh, back to neutral again. So let's dive in and take a look at um, the key charts. This is the S&P. You can see Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, pretty definite selling. So that was the week that was. If we pan back and take a uh, take a broader look, you can see we've now come back to the 200-day moving average, which is still rising. So let's you know let's keep all this in perspective. It was a, it was a nasty week, um, but with, with pretty good reason, I would have thought. Um, and the 200-day moving average is still rising, and the price hasn't breached it yet. So um, it's, you know, it, it's not a situation where the market is just completely falling apart. That's, that's not happening at this stage. Now, things could get worse and we could head down here. And that's why it's so critical to have an open, flexible mind 
about what the market is likely to do. If you lock yourself into some sort of um, predetermined um, thought about where the market is going, then you know, you're going to be in a lot of strife. Let's look at uh, a couple of the charts um, that I spoke about. There's Netflix up very, very strongly, up uh, 16% and held it on Friday. <clears throat> That's very impressive when the, when the general market sentiment was completely negative. Um, there's Tesla. Tesla went the opposite way, down on, heavily down on Thursday and then again down further on Friday. And in the, um, in the solar industry, there's Solar Edge as one. Market didn't like their earnings at all in their outlook, and the stock got punished down around thirty percent. So very, very significant moves in that uh, in the area. Okay, let's look at the where the money flows are going, and not a lot of change here. Nasdaq versus the S and P. Nasdaq down slightly more than the S and P. So this is the relativity between the two, but. Um, you know, when, again, as I've been saying now for many, many weeks, we're not getting this rollover that we saw back at the start of 2022. Now, that could still materialize and, and you've got to be flexible enough to, to see that, but um, we're just not seeing that level of, um, uh, of action to the downside at this stage. So that's a bit of a positive. Um, Semiconductors versus the S and P. Um, semiconductors came off during the week, and we'll look at that actual chart in a minute. But um, we're still in an overall consolidation, so not a good week for semiconductors. Um, but again, it's it's just within a consolidation on a relative basis. If we look at the semiconductor sector itself, yes, there is a Bit of a downward channel, but it's pretty mild. And certainly some elevated selling and volumes on Thursday and Friday. So one, this is certainly one to watch. Um, I've been very pleased and very comfortable with how the semiconductor sector has been running. Um, but the last couple of days just give me a little bit of pause. Just This is one, one to be watched. You wouldn't want to see semiconductors start to break down. Now, looking at the relativity over the last quarter, energy did come off at the end of the week. In fact, all sectors came off at the end of the week, as you can see. But the order is not, is not changing. So we've got energy at the top, communication services, which is the aggressive sector. Um, then we've got, uh, we've got healthcare. Technology is sort of middle of the pack. Um, banking at the bottom and, and U.S. banks. And their outlook statements were um, were pretty good. They beat expectations in almost all cases. And you come down to the bottom and you've got consumer discretionary and consumer staples at the bottom of the pack. So that is not um, that is not a money flow situation that's that's um, pointing to a really gloomy outlook for the market as a whole. This is the Australian market. Energy clearly the best here. But everything else was definitely on the slide in our market, but we'll come back to that. And if we just have a quick look at the currencies, there's the US dollar down very slightly, but the Australian dollar was down as well. A bit of a commodity price effect there. The Aussie market, uh, 62.5 is where our dollar finished. Our market fell 2.2% for the week, but one would expect that we're going to see some more falls on, uh, on Monday morning. Uh, energy sector was, was pretty much it, was the only sector to resist the tide. But I did notice looking through several hundred charts as I do every day on the, uh, on the market individual stock charts, the trading volumes were generally pretty light and often market depth was pretty thin, but just wasn't much buying or selling uh, depth ar around the, you know, around the current price point. It was like everybody's just stepped back and they're not really that active. They're, they're watching and, and waiting to see what happens. Precious metals, uh, gold was up another $50. It 
it got within three dollars of um of the two thousand dollar mark. So I guess no surprises here with what's happening in the Middle East. Translate that into Australian dollars, we get uh, 3171, so extremely profitable territory for Aussie, dollar, uh, Aussie gold stocks. We saw a little bit of response from global gold stocks, GDXJ being the, um, the benchmark. We saw some response in the Australian market, but it wasn't really emphatic. It wasn't the sort of it wasn't sort of the sort of gains on big volumes that um, that I might have expected to see. So again, it's just like it's a market that just doesn't know what to do with the current information and the current situations. I'll just take a sorry, just a quick look at um, at the gold price. So this gold on a uh, on a daily chart, pretty pretty concerted gain since um, since the um, situation with Israel and Palestine started um, a couple of weeks ago, and that's it on a weekly chart. So two very strong weeks. It's the gold market. Turning now to other commodities, uh, copper was steady, 359, nickel edged up just fractionally. Crude oil made it above 90, um, but finished at, uh, at 89. Uh, there is the possibility, you know, if, if this situation in the, in the Middle East really escalates, that we could see some sort of embargo on nations that are supporting Israel. I mean, that's a, that's a wild card. Um, and if you know if that happens, then a spike in oil price spikes inflation, and you know that's that's not good for anything really. So that's uh, that's one one to watch. So it's a pretty volatile situation, that's for sure. Um, lithium. Sorry, I forgot. To just amend that uh, amend that chart. So. If we look at lithium news, um, lithium carbonate prices were up in the week by 2.3%. Is that sustainable? Don't know, but it was the first gain since August. So that's a little bit of a green shoot there in the lithium market. I'm, I must say, I'm, I'm a little confused by some of this data. Now, admittedly, this data is coming from different sources, but I'll present for what it's worth um, just to give you an overall perspective. So we've got Lithium price is ticking up a little bit. We've got global EV sales setting a record in September. Um, and those sales were up uh, 23% compared to September of the previous year. So we're still seeing very good growth in electric vehicles. And it was up 7% month on month. Um, China sales are up 33% year to date, according to, um, to a company called Row Motion, and global sales are up 50% year on year, according to the Kelly Blue Book in California. So you look at all that and you think, well, why are lithium prices down 60, 70% this year? And I'm talking about product prices, not stock prices. And it seems that 2023 has been very much a year of a destocking story. Um, and that the restocking hasn't really happened yet in the face of rising demand. Um, and so therefore you would think that higher prices are inevitable. It's just a matter of when, particularly when the long-term outlook, I mean, even the most bearish of predictors and commentators is saying that the lithium market will be in significant deficit by 2027. Um, so you know, it's 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 a strange situation in the lithium market, and reflects the fact that it's it's really a, it's still an immature market. And establishing what is a a fair value price is still difficult, and made more difficult because of these quite dramatic destocking and then restocking um, episodes that uh, that China manufacturers go through. Um, Let's look a little bit more generally at critical minerals. According to um, 
to benchmark minerals in 2022. They said that 330 new mines would be needed by 2030 across the sectors of lithium, graphite, nickel, and cobalt. 330 new mines. I mean, that's just absolutely staggering. That was what they said back in uh, 2022. I don't know whether they've changed their their tune or not. Um, but adding to that, um, Wood McKenzie has also said that $200 billion worth of new transition metals are needed by 2030 to meet demand. So I think there's there's general agreement and acceptance that an enormous amount of new mine building has to happen that isn't remotely, not even remotely happening at the moment. The capital required is is just not forthcoming um, at the current metal prices. So if governments and society in general is is going to achieve these decarbonisation objectives, um, then metal prices have got to go up to incentivise the exploration of the development because it's just not going to happen at the current prices. So that's the situation with commodities in general. So it's still the same. We've got an absolutely magnificent long-term opportunities. 20, 2026, maybe 2025 through to 2030 is, is going to be one of the best opportunities I think you'll ever see in your lifetime. Um, but at the moment, we've got a period of uncertainty that might last months or might even last a couple of years. So position yourself accordingly. But in my view, sustained higher prices of commodities and sustained higher commodity stocks um, is, is inevitable. That's the opportunity. This is spot copper chart. I still haven't been able to find out what, what the uh, heck this spike was in, uh, in copper on this Kitco chart. It can't possibly be genuine, so I don't know why Kitco has corrected it. But anyway, won't worry too much about that. This is the spot nickel chart. No real change there. So wrapping it up, um, making predictions at any time is is just plain silly, and trying to make predictions at the moment is is completely nonsense because we've we've got such a fluid situation in in many respects with you know, Ukraine, Middle East. China and Taiwan and America's position in the world. There's just so many things are in a state of flux that uh, you try to put your stake in the, in the ground and say, you know, I think this is going to happen by X, Y, Z date is, um, is just not sensible. The environment's just changing too quickly. It's too unpredictable. So the most important commodity you can have is a mind that's open, that's willing to shift its position quickly, just your your portfolio weightings. So how do you go about that? Look, it's, it's what I talk about every day in the Insiders Club. It's what I talk about every week in Portfolio Analyst. You've just got to be heavy in quality stocks that will still grow in tough times. And look, they're out there. They're not that hard to find once you get, you know, once you get on, on the right sort of thinking path about what you're looking for. So, um, there's, um, there's a great deal of opportunity now. We're seeing short-term volatility, sure, but the lower that prices go in quality stocks that can grow in tough times, then the, the less the short-term downside and the greater the long-term return. So I don't have to lose sight of that dynamic. Portfolio analysts last week, consistent with this, we looked at the, the big picture pathway to, to building wealth, how to how to think about where the opportunities are, how to analyze them, how to find them, and how to go about increasing the probability of a consistent, positive, long-term return. It's about a plan. It's about selection. It's certainly about reading technical analysis well. And it's about controlling your emotions, your emotions around patience, impatience, and, and fear and greed. So very good session in portfolio last week. There's more information on the website. There's my email address. And um, there'll be no Sunday video next week. I'm, I'm just not going to be in a position to, to do it. So a one-week break, and I'll be back with you after that. That's it for this update. Cheers.